you juggle all that stuff? <laughs> Thank you. All right, everybody. Hello. I get the hardest section. I get to close after you've eaten. If anybody starts going to sleep, I'm going to point you out and say, hey, you lady in the green, wake up, wake up, wake up. <laughs> do we need to do jumping jacks? Yes, she says yes. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to be before you long. I just want to share something with you that God gave to me. Um, I think it's going to be an awesome word because it falls right in line. When Lindsay was talking last night, I was like, oh, okay, God, you, she kind of said some of the stuff I got. And then when Marquita came up and was talking, and I was like, she's saying some of the stuff I have got too. What am I going to say? But God being God, he blends it all together. And I believe I'm going to give you the cap on it. And when we leave here, we are going to be strong, mighty, powerful ladies. Okay? <laughs> Father God, in Jesus' name, we come giving you all praise and all honor and all glory. It is a privilege, Lord, for you to allow me to represent you. I am your mouthpiece, Lord, and I pray that you use me to reach and touch everyone here and that we all leave change. Lord, I give you the floor today. And I ask, God, that your word penetrates our hearts, that it changes us, and that we, Father, are stronger for having sat in your presence these last two days. In Jesus' name, amen. I would sing for you guys, but then I could really clear the room. <laughs> You don't want to hear me sing. The title of my message today is Friend Requests. And we've been talking a lot about Facebook and social media and the do's and the don'ts. And then I come along and God gives me friend requests. Before we start, I want to give you the definition of a friend. And it might be a little lengthy, but listen to me because you need to hear it. I got it from the Urban Dictionary. They had the best description. A friend is someone you love and who loves you, someone you respect and who respects you, someone you trust and who trusts you. A friend is honest and makes you want to be honest. A friend is loyal. A friend is someone who is happy to spend time with you doing absolutely nothing. A friend is someone who not only doesn't care if you're ugly or boring, but doesn't even think about it. A friend is someone who forgives you no matter what you do, and someone who tries to help you even when they don't know how to. A friend is someone who tells you that you're being stupid, but who doesn't make you feel stupid. A friend is someone who sacrifices their life and their happiness for you, someone to look forward to seeing a friend is a partner not a leader or a follower a friend is someone who won't lie to you they help you with your problems and they're always there when you're feeling down a friend is someone who you have a bond with and cannot be replaced we have become so comfortable with God's love and his grace and his mercy that we're losing sight of his word. I heard someone say one day, you, nothing can ever separate me from God's grace. And I know you got that wrong because the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says nothing can separate you from God's love. But you can be separated from God's grace because God said he resists the proud and he gives his grace to the humble. So if you're puffed up and you're in pride, then I got news for you. God does not give you his grace. God's grace empowers. And if he's going to empower us, why would he empower you to be proud and to be filled with pride? If God's grace empowers us and you're on this road of stupidity, why would he empower you to be more stupid? <laughs> Just saying. So if you think that you cannot run from up under the umbrella of grace, then you're wrong. You can't run from up under the umbrella of love because the Bible tells us God will love you all the way to hell. 
but you can run from up under the umbrella of grace. Facebook has a definition for friendship, and it allows you to have informal friendships by simply adding someone to a list of contacts associated with social media networking websites, and you can have all the superficial friends you want, thousands of them. The problem with that is, and the reason why God is bringing it to our attention, is because right in the middle of Facebook are God's Christians. We're sitting right there in the middle. Sometimes you can't tell the difference between them and people that are in the world. I saw two people post something on Facebook that was their truth, but it was so hurtful and offensive to other people, and I, I prayed and I said, God, it might be their truth, but did they think about how harmful that sounds? How offensive it was to someone else? God is calling us to the carpet today. Because we are going to have to line up with what the word says a friend is. And I just read you one of the best definitions for what a friend was. And we can hit friend request and ask someone to be our friend. And this is what God is expecting you to be. You can hit friend acceptance and accept a friend. And this is what God is expecting you to be. There's not going to be a leeway for you to say, oh, Miss Mary, you just you're kind of blowing it out of proportion. I, I didn't bring the message God brought me. Remember, I yielded myself. And I ask him to speak through me. So I'm not bringing you this message for myself. I'm bringing you the message from God. You are abusing Facebook. And when you take Instagram, Facebook, and all the other social media networks, and you hurt other people with them, where is God? So God is calling us to the carpet today. I want to give you an example of what a friend looks like. And I'm going to start with the best example we can have, which is Jesus. In John 8, it talks about the lady that was caught in adultery. And most of us know that story. I'm looking at the Passion Translation. It said that Jesus walked up the Mount Olives near the city where he spent the night. Then at dawn, Jesus appeared in the temple court again, and soon all the people gathered around to listen to his words. So he sat down and taught them. Then in the middle of his teaching, the religious scholars and the Pharisees broke through the crowd and brought a woman who had been caught in the act of committing adultery and made her stand in the middle of them. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a minute. Jesus spent the night in this city. The scholars were not just people, Pharisees and scholars. They were not just normal people. The scholars are the people that were sought after when there needed to be an explanation of the law of Moses. So they knew the rules. They knew Jesus was spending the night here. So they devised a trick, a plan, a plot, that they were going to see if they could make Jesus fall. When I look at this, they don't tell you specifically how they did it, but let's just let, let me just let my imagination run wild. And let me say that they went and saw that there was a certain woman who committed certain acts all the time, and this is usually her time frame of when she worked. So we are sure to be able to find her in the act of adultery in the morning hours because they said that it was dawn when Jesus came. He got up real early. It was done when Jesus went into the courtyard and started to teach. So they caught her in the act around the time Jesus was teaching. There's another scenario to this. They could have plotted with the man that they caught her with and said, don't worry, we're not going to stone you. We're just going to stone her. We just want to be able to catch her in the act to use it against Jesus. So here it was, these scholars biblical men of God using somebody else's darkness. This lady was a prostitute. She sold herself. But that was her darkness. And they took her darkness and used the darkness in her life to try to 
crashed somebody else's life. Scholars of the Bible. They brought this woman, and I'm sure they didn't say, sweetie, get up and get dressed, fix your makeup, comb your hair. They brought this woman, I'm sure dragging her, because nobody wants to be put on display in front of a crowd, dragging her, I'm sure, hopefully with just a sheet tied around her. And they said they forced their way through the crowd, and they stood her right in the middle of everyone. They exposed her darkness and put it on total display. Then they said to Jesus, teacher, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Doesn't Moses' law command us to stone to death a woman like this? Tell us, what do you say we should do with her? The Bible goes on to say they were only testing Jesus, hoping to trap him with his own words and accuse him of breaking the laws of Moses. But Jesus didn't answer them. Instead, he simply bent down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Angry, they kept insisting. They got mad. Jesus, you hear us? You see this woman standing here. You know there's an answer to this. I want you to answer us. So they kept insisting that he answer the question. Upon their assistance and them not realizing that, um, you see, I'm not really trying to participate in this. I'm writing in this dirt, but you're going to force me to have to answer you. So he stood up and he said to them, let him, the man who has never had a sinful desire, throw the first stone. When he said that, he bent back down and started to write in the dirt again. Upon hearing that, they said that the accusers started to walk away. One um, person, a commentary, says that they believe that he wrote the Leviticus law in the dirt, which was reminding the scholars that they were spiritual adulterers because they were forsaking God and that they were the first ones that started to drop their rocks and they started to walk away. Then Jesus, as you know, turned to the woman and asked her, where were your accusers? He said, I don't accuse you. Either go and sin no more. Now, what the reason for my story is because I'm trying to show you what a real friend is. Let's put this in Facebook time. In Facebook time, when the plot was being made, when they went to drag the woman out of the house, somebody would have had their cell phone camera on. (laughs) Somebody would have took pictures. Somebody would have just been recording it, and somebody would have went live. (laughs) Oh, it's three ways to do it now. (laughs) And they would have been following that woman and following that crowd all the way through. They would have been pushing through and running to get the best angle, angle, and somebody would have ran up in front so they can get her coming through the crowd, and it would have been a gigantic display all over Facebook. And you would have said, share, 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 share. Because Facebook loves mess. Now, it doesn't matter about the good that Facebook does, because it it has some good. But it has a lot of mess. And this would have been the center of attention for days, because it would have gone viral with them standing there, her hair matted all over the place, and her standing there half clothed and her darkness being exposed. The bad part about it is that some of our fingers would have been on those share buttons. The bad part is some of our fingers would have been typing comments. The bad part is some of us would have been saying, did you see that post on Facebook? We, Christians, who God says that love covers a multitude of sins. You'll never see me a day in my life where I'll always be perfect. And if you're my friend, I want you to say to me, Mary, you're not doing this and you're not doing that and you're falling short. But don't put me on Facebook. Don't tell Facebook, you know, Mary fell today. I heard Mary say this, and I heard her say that, and she fell today. Oh, girl, I got a recording of it. 
I'm going to send it by her because, you know, she thinks she ought to get up there preaching that word and stuff. But let me let them see what she can do right now. <laughs> You're supposed to be my friend. You're supposed to be my sister. You're supposed to be my covering. You're supposed to be that tool that Jesus uses to get me back on my feet, not to drag me through the dirt. But here we are. We have to judge ourselves. I know how many friends I have on Facebook. Some of them I know, some of them I don't know. But I still make sure that I respect them. I make sure that if I see something about them that I don't like and their darkness comes about, I hide the post because I don't want it on my page. I don't want it to continue to be a news feed on my page, so I'll hide the post. If it's something that I feel like that, that, that I can address, then I'll say in their inbox, hey, I'm going to hit you up, I'm going to call you. I've called and said, sweetie, that's not a good look for a Christian. Oh, I just do it for fun, but God doesn't laugh, and God doesn't play, and God doesn't enjoy this. See, the pictures that we keep spreading around of people and their ugliness they might want them to go viral, but do you not realize that's their pain? Who wants their picture to go viral in their ugliest form? Nobody does. But their pain makes them laugh at themselves with you because they can't find a friend to love them and to take them for who they are. So in order to have some type of friend, then I'll just take a phony friend. So, yeah, they're getting a big laugh out of me. Yeah, they're laughing behind my back. But they're my friends. No, they're not. No, we're not. Another friend that Jesus faced, the lady at the well. He talked to her and told her he was giving her the gift of life, living water. And he said to her, go get your husband. And she said, um, I don't have a husband. And he said, I know you've had five. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. He told her the truth. Now, Jesus could have waited till the disciples came back, and he could have said all this out loud in front of the disciples. That would have made a good campfire conversation for later on that night when they could have said, I wonder who the other five were. I know who she's living with now, but she had five husbands. How do you think she got five husbands? Who do you think five people wanted her? It could have been great campfire talk. Oh, it would have went viral on Facebook. But Jesus didn't say that to her in front of anybody else. He simply said to her the truth and told her to go. And she went running because she had new life and she had just drank living water. When we are in the world, we are like clunkers. And I'm going to use an analogy of us being like cars. So we're like little clunkers that are walking around. And I'm going to use an example of my own life and me and my own little pitiful little sin. Um, my doors could have been dented and dinged and my hood rusted and, and I could have had an antenna or maybe no antenna, maybe a, a clothes hanger where my antenna used to be and uh, maybe a bumper and maybe no bumper. It just kind of depends. You know, sin will make a mess out of your life, right? So we're riding around in life and we're clunkers. And, and we're just clunking along and putting spitting and smoke flying all behind us. And people trying to dodge and dodge around from all the black smoke we're spitting out of. And then one day we meet Jesus. And when we meet Jesus, he says, over in his word in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, that this means that anyone who belongs to him becomes a new person and that old things are gone and a new life begins. And when this new life begins with me, then Jesus takes this old clunker that I am and he sits me in front of him and he starts to teach me. And in him teaching me, he says, okay, I'm going to teach you that lying is not of me. So he snatches that old rusty door off me, and, and, and he puts on a new door, right? 
And see, my car, I, my sin so bad, it's so, I can't even open my driver's door to get in. I had to go through the passenger door and climb over to the seat and get up under the stern wheel to be able to drive. So Jesus gave me a new door so I'll be able to get under my driver's seat without any. And then he comes in and he fixes other parts of my life. And he takes me and he gives me a new paint job. When I, was got, when I got saved and really came to know who Jesus was other than being a good church girl, I was 24 years old. So I had a little age on my car, you know. I became a classic. And the thing about a classic is that a classic is a car that is being restored, that it's worth preserving rather than scrapping. Jesus made me a collectible. And Jesus thought I was worthy of not being sent off to the crash thing, wherever they crush the cars and send them off and destroy them. He thought I was worth preserving. So he took me and he began to shape and form me and put things in my life called truths. And he asked me, would I take the things that I learned in the world and exchange them for the truth that he was offering me, and then I can swap out. And before you know it, I was like a shiny brand new penny. I was a classic. And I was the one that was driving down the street, and I had not become brand new in myself, but I was brand new in Christ. And in being brand new in Christ, I was somebody to see. You ever seen a classic car go down the street? Yes. You stop and look at it. I don't care what you're driving. You can be driving 2020. You can be driving the brand newest car that can ever be with no miles on it. But you will stop and look at a classic going down the street. One of the greatest classics is a 61 car van. Who won't look at a brand new remodeled 61 car van? The Camaros, the Monte Carlos, the, the, the Cutlasses, all those cars people take and restore, you stop and you watch them when they go down the street because they're classic. They're collectibles. And that's the way Jesus took us. And when people do have classics and collectibles, then they take them and they'll put covers on them. And, and because you need to protect them and restore them because you put in a lot of work and a lot of money on making them brand new and you'll put them in the garages and you'll back them up in the garage. Well, see, I'm that kind of classic. Jesus has taken me and he's restored me and he took my rust off and he took my dings out and he took my dents out. And then he said that I can dwell in the shadows of the almighty God. He says that I abide in him. So see, he's my covering. And I back up and I rest in his shadow. So I'm in his garage. And I'm protected and I'm shielded. So that he's asking me as a classic and as a collective, collectible to not tangle myself with the world. Now while he does all this work on me, here I come out of the garage and I'm going for a ride. And I turn the corner and I let every Tom, Dick, and Harry get in my car and ride. I'm a classic. Surely. Excuse me? Sin knocks on my door. Will you give me a ride? Oh, yeah, come on. I'll give you a ride. Sin knocks on my door. Can I drive your car? Sure, you can drive my car. Come on, get in. But you're a classic. And if you're going to be a classic and you're going to be somebody that's in Christ, then would you not protect who you are? You can't get in my car. You no know, muddy shoes and, and, and rain dripping off of you. No, this is a classic. This is I'm somebody. So you can't bring anything into my life. And that's what God is trying to show us. We keep letting the world in our lives and we keep letting the world take control of our lives because we want to be in the know. We want to have 30,000 friends on Facebook. And the world says, oh, look how popular she is. 
But do you not know that you got to stand before God and give him an account for 30,000 friends that you don't even know, care, or pay any attention to? And you say, oh, Miss Mary, they don't make the... Let me get you a scripture, because, see, I don't want you to think that I should. <laughs> the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10, so whether we are here in the body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Yes, you will stand before God. Yes, you will have to tell him about your walk with Christ. Don't worry about me, guys. I got it. You will have to tell him about your walk with Christ. Yes, you will have to tell him about those people that you laughed at on Facebook, about those people that you passed along and shared their ugly stories and their sins. Yes, you will. And guess what? God says in his word that he looks after his friends. You know why he looks after his friends? Because he died for all of them. So just like you might be his Christian and they might be sinners, they're still his friends. So he cares that we as Christians not destroy his friends. He cares that we as Christians not destroy each other. So will we have to give an account? Yes, we will. Yes, we are going to be judged for our love walk. We are going to have to stand before God because the world says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die because they believe we're just going to go back to the dirt and live in the ground. But you know we're going to stand before God and we'll be in heaven or hell. We are going to be judged, and they are going to be judged. So we cannot sit back and just let ourselves, our classic cars, be treated like clunkers. I was asking God one time because I was going through some things in my life and I was just in a struggle. I was in a funk. And I knew the word. And sometimes you can know the word, but sometimes it's like, you just feel disconnected at some point. And I, I, I just started to crave a baby. Not for myself, okay? And my, 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 my three oldest kids, they had gone through that point that they'd had their children, and they were done having a baby. And then my baby girl had not come to the point that where it was time for her to have a baby. So I was like, God, I don't know what it is. I just want a baby. I just want a baby around me. And I knew it was a spiritual thing, but I, I, I thought it was a fleshly baby. It was. I, I wanted a fleshly baby. I wanted to touch something new. Well, my daughter had begged my husband for nine years to let her have a dog, and my husband faithfully told her nine years, no, <laughs> he did not want a dog. And then one day, she, she graduated December 13th at 10 o'clock. I, I, oh, when I found that, that date, I said it all the time for six months. She graduated December 13th at 10 o'clock. And um, I, right, uh, maybe two or three weeks before she graduated, she announced to me that her dad told her when she graduated from college, he was going to let her get a dog. And I said, your dad said that? And she said, yeah. And I asked him, and he really told her that. And I said, oh, my goodness, this has to be God. <laughs> well, her graduation was coming up December 13th, and I kept telling him, I said, you promised this girl this dog. When she graduates, you need to start looking for this dog. And um, he says, oh, y'all will do it. Y'all will find it. So she and I found the dog, and his name is Benji. He's a little Yorkster, little uh, terrier, Yorkshire terrier. And uh, there's Benji. Isn't he cute? Oh, little Benji. When Benji came into our lives, he was maybe two pounds. And he was the newest 
thing in the world. His little tongue was about the size of my, th my finger. And I used to sit there and watch him yawn. And I thought, oh, look at his little bitty tongue. <laughs> and I used to just look at him. He's standing with his little paws and his hair covered his feet so you couldn't see his little claws and stuff. And I'd be like, oh, just look. I say, Benji, boy, oh, you're so sweet. Benji was that answer of fulfillment of that newness that I wanted in my life. And I thought, okay, it was a dog. It was a person. I'm fine. But Jennifer went to California for a graduation gift also, and she left little Benji at home with me for 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> he won but two pounds, and he slept with her. And... <laughs> I didn't think it was going to happen. I was prepared to take Benji and go sleep in the guest room. But my husband said, no, you and Benji, come on. And I'm thinking, God, this is you. This man is letting <laughs> me and Benji get in the bed with him. <laughs> so Benji and I and my husband and I slept together for 10 days. Well, he let us sleep there, but my husband did not assume any of the responsibility for Benji. So being like any new thing he was like a new baby and he has a very very small bladder and he had to go to the bathroom at night so i'm out getting up at 12 o'clock one o'clock two o'clock and i'm taking benji to the bathroom and um i'm saying okay and about that time we had this outbreak of coyotes i live out in the woods and the coyotes were out and they were howling and the dogs were barking and benji was looking at me and i'm looking at benji and i'm <laughs> I'm like, do your business, do your business. We going in the house, you know. <laughs> and um, I'm trying to get back in the house, and we go in, and then the next night this routine keeps going over and over. And then we went outside one night, and this was like January, so it was cold, and we're out, and I'm saying, Benji, I'm sleepy. Please, please go do your business so we can do it. And I was training him to potty. I said, go potty, go potty, go potty. And he would try to do his little potty. He would look at me. He would jump over the leaves. And I'm thinking, Benji, please, just potty. And he came and he sat by my feet one day. And in my mind's eye, I saw myself pick him up and throw him in the yard and say, please. <laughs> Girl wanted to go to sleep, right? <laughs> it was like 2 or 3 in the morning. Benji, go, you know? So I didn't do it, of course, but I walked out in the yard, and it was cold, and he followed me, and I said, okay, now do it. It was like, I'm not going out there by myself. You come in the grass, too. So we're standing in the grass waiting on Benji to use the bathroom. Well, about that time, I'm on my way in the house, and the Lord decides he wants to talk. <laughs> so he said, Mary... When you're in sin, I do you the same way you didn't do Benji. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I don't toss you away. I'm like, oh, Lord, this wasn't serious moments here. You know, I was on my way back to sleep. But um, I said, I said, yeah, God, you, you're right, you don't. He said, that's the newness that you want. He said, you've forgotten my love. And he said, when you don't keep it in the forefront of your mind, he says, and you get so busy doing so many things, he said, you're working as a machine rather than out of that love. I, Benji, Lord, come in the house. You take him outside, he'll come back in the house, and he's looking at me. I'm saying, come on, I'm taking him back outside. And I'm, 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 I said, but that's just such a sweet boy. You just got my little baby. And I take him outside, and my husband said, he needs to pop him. I said, don't you pop that baby. <laughs> I said, he's just a baby. I said, don't pop that baby. You leave him alone. I said, he'll get it, he'll get it. And God said, I don't pop you. And I said, oh, Lord, you're teaching me with this dog. Okay. And we go, and we're walking, and Benji stays right on top of me. He follows me. Everywhere I go, Benji follows me. Jennifer will come home. He'll go follow her. And it's just all the time. He's right there with you. And God said to me, I'm with you like that, too. 
And I was like, God, you really love me, don't you? I said, because this little rascal, and he comes, and when I get in the house, come home from work, he grabs my pants leg, and I drag him like this <laughs> off the house. And we're walking, and I just say, Jim, I just love you. Just so good. The little pinky's just so happy to see Gigi. Gee, gee. And I'm just dragging him through the house, and God is reminding me, I'm with you. I'm going all the way through life with you. And Benji now is three months old, and he's about five pounds now. But every day, God reminds me of how much he loves me through that little dog. Because I don't care how many times Benji pees in the house. I don't care how many times Pop say pop him. I still protect him. I say, don't pop him. And Jennifer will thump him. I stop thumping him. I said, Benji, come to me. Just come to me. You stay with me. And I'm shielding him and I'm guarding him because, see, he reminds me too much of Jesus' love for me. And I know he's going to get it. He's just still a baby. And Jesus is still working with me. And there's some things in my life that I'm seeing working for me to get. And he's patient with me. So I'm being patient with Benji. And, and, and you know, I slip up and I might be on the floor myself, you know. And Jesus don't come and swap me. And, you know, he's just saying, it's okay. You'll, you'll get it right. Come on. Remember what you're supposed to be doing. Remember the word. Remember what the word say. Benji reminded me of the tenderness of God. And that's what we've forgotten. His tenderness, his love, his grace, his mercy. His mercy is renewed every day. So while we might look at somebody and say, oh, they're just such an ugly person. Guess what? You think they've been ugly for 10 years and God saw them ugly just this morning. His mercy is renewed every day. If God held everything that we did the day before against us, he would blow us up. Because he, he couldn't keep all that stuff in front of him and not punish us and persecute us for it. So he forgets all that mess and he throws it all away. And the next day he has new mercy. And that's all he's asking us for. We have got to learn to be merciful with God. We have got to learn to be, I mean, for God, for other people. We have got to learn to let God use us. Because why? That's what he told us to do. Go ye therefore into all the world. And when you got yourself entangled with Facebook and those 30,000 friends, you definitely went into all the world. So now your responsibility is to cover your 30,000 friends with love. Now, whether you request it or accept it, it still becomes your responsibility. You might not physically love them, but you do owe them respect. And if you're going to respect them, you have to respect them the way God does them. Shame on Christian women when you see another Christian woman fall and you run and tell somebody else. Shame on Christian women when you don't come to her and say, you're my sister. I don't want to see you in darkness. And you tell her in love that this is not godly and you shouldn't do this. Once you do that, then you've done what God told you to do. And then you step back and you pray. You don't put her in the gossip mill. You don't talk about it. You don't share. You pray. And you cover her. In my real girls talk, it started because God said that we destroy each other with pettiness, that we as women are our own worst enemies because we lash out at each other over the little simple things. I think one of the sisters said, I, I think it was this morning, she said, you, you talk about what people wear, you talk about what they drive, where they live. You talk about how their hair looks and how their hair doesn't look. It's always a conversation about something that is not pleasing according to your standard. But when did I find in this word your standard? <laughs> when did I find a law according to Mary in here? How is it that I can take what my standard might be and say that your standard is wrong? God forbid. We as women of God have been called to be lioness. And God 
gave me that word when we were having one of our sessions, our real girls talk, and we're on number 15, God. So I thought God was going to do this for one or two times, and we were going to be through, but we're still rolling. I got two sessions already the rest of this month, but we are, God is, is, is adamant about destroying pettiness. He's adamant about destroying the things the devil is using to get between us because we as a sisterhood, we have got to come together because iron sharpens iron. A friend sharpens a friend. I cannot depend on the world to sharpen me. I need my sisters of Christ to sharpen me. So God is saying, get rid of this little stuff that don't make any difference. So what if I wear purple and gray or purple and whatever, uh, green? Maybe you don't like those colors together. What difference does it make? But we let little silly things set us apart to where we can't come together and fellowship together because we got all this little petty crap that's sitting between us that can't let me love you. I won't physically love everybody in, in a, in, in a huggy-huggy way, but I'll love you because you're my sister. I'll love you because the body of Christ can't be made up without you and without me. So we have to join together. When the lioness came up, I went back and I got Lisa Bavaria's book, and I started reading about it because she wrote a book about the lioness a few years ago. And I started looking back at her book, and the lion is one of my favorite animals, by the way. Anyway, it's a personal thing. But anyway, it's one of my favorite animals. So when I was studying about the lion, it, um, it, it was fascinating to me. And, and I start looking at how Jesus, being the lion of Judah, and we're lioness, and he's saying that I need my sisters to be like lioness. I need them to be strong. No matter how strong the male lion is, and no matter how ferocious his roar is, because um, the, the books say that a male lion's roar can be heard for 25 miles when he's a mature lion. That that's why other animals are so afraid of them, because they hear him before they see him. And when they hear him, they are afraid that it might be some gigantic giant coming. They don't know that it's this man here and you're an elephant way up here. All they know is he roars. So they are fearful of his roar. However, that male lion is not necessarily the nucleus. nucleus what, say that word. Nucleus. There you go. It's not the nucleus of that pride. It's the lioness. They do the hunting and the feeding. They do not fuss and c complain with each other because most time he is the father of all their children. Most of the time they are all sisters. It is they when when a baby is born, the, the male lion that's had the female lion that has the baby, she goes away and births the baby, but when she comes back, the baby goes into a group and all of the mothers take care of the babies. When there's danger that comes into the camp. One female lion is assigned the cubs, and she gathers the cubs, and she takes them away. And the other female lion goes and takes care of whatever the problem is. They work together. They are a pride. They are lifted up. And that's why they call their grouping a pride. And that's what God is calling for us to be, a pride, lioness of God. Because they work together without bickering. Two sisters having babies by the same man? Come on now. Come on now, y'all know that's Facebook news all the way. Y'all know that, that would be a fight and a war to the end. But here it is, however many that are in that pride, they had the babies by that one lion. And they didn't even fight about it. The first cousins didn't even fight. They all got together and they grew up together and, and, and frolic around together. And when the, when the war comes and the lioness out there fighting the baby lions back there, rawr, 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 you know, and they just scratching and pawing and wanting the claw too. But it, it's a group and they're together and they're joined together. And God has called us as women of God to join together as lioness. 
I, my husband sent me a video, for those of you that heard me saying forgive me, you can hear it again. Um, in that video, one time a male lion ventured off his territory and ended up out of his zone of protection. And he found himself surrounded with 20 hyenas. And the hyenas realized he by himself. He's on our territory. So they began to nip at him. And they surrounded him. And they would nip from this side and jump. And the lion being who he was, he slung them off. And, but they kept coming. Well, the hyenas weren't brave enough to attack him all at one time because they really would have had him down. So they were just trying to nip and, and pull him down until somebody got a stronghold on him, you know. But he was tossing them and roaring, and he said his little, you know, made his little roar. Well, in him making his roar, it sent a message. And the message that it sent went to his woman. <laughs> so all of a sudden, the hyenas are nipping and picking at him, and then you start to see them back up. And they all came and they were forming their own little group and they were backing up. And the cameras panned over and all you saw was that lioness coming out of those weeds. And all 20 of those hyenas backed off of that lion. She came and she stood with her man and they nuzzled faces and did all the things that they did. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, God. They still 20 to 2. Why did they back off? And what I didn't know was, in the weeds laying down were her sisters. And you could just see their heads. And it was like, don't make us get up. <laughs> we will take care of this, okay? It's up to you. Now, you can run on and go on about your business if you want to, but if we get up, we ain't backing down till we take care of all of y'all. The hyenas knew that. They knew, even though they saw one lioness, they knew she didn't run by herself. They knew she came with a pack. That's what we have to learn to be. We have got to run with a pack, and that pack has got to be strong Christian women that have decided to throw away this stupidity of the world. Guys, we are, the time for this world are running out. You got people that are dying young. People are not living long anymore. Well, guess what? Were you one of the people that crossed their path? Did you tell them about Jesus? Will God say to you, you know, so-and-so died when they were 30 years old, but they passed you and you didn't have anything to say to them. But they were your Facebook friend. Come on, guys. It's serious business. We have got to stop saying that we are Christians, and we have got to start being Christians. We have got to start. We have got to stop being like the world, and we got to stop allowing the devil to use us to hurt each other. We got to stop walking around with phony smiles on our faces, thinking that we're hiding who the real us is. The Holy Spirit reveals all truth. You're only fooling yourself. Cockham and Com Company wrote a song, and I, want, I wanted to tell you, I love this song. It's called One Day. It says, one day there'll be no more waiting left for our souls. One day there'll be no more children longing for home. One day when the kingdom comes right here where we stand, we will see the promised land. One day there'll be no more lives taken too soon. One day there'll be no more need for hospital rooms. One day every tear that falls will be wiped by his hand. We will see the promised land. One day there'll be no more anger left in our eyes. One day the color of our skin won't cause a divide. One day we'll be family standing hand in hand and we will see the promised land. Psalms 27 and 13 says that I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That one day is today. 
is today in my life because I choose to be a clown. I choose that when you look at me, that you see Jesus through me. I don't want you to look at me. I, I'm not such a much. I ain't nothing to look at. But I want you to see the life of Jesus living so strongly through me that when you look at me and I pass by, you will stop and look. And you'll say, there go that woman who always living for Jesus. <laughs> there go that woman who chooses not to lie. There go that woman who won't hang out with the crowd just to be popular. There go that woman that you can talk about her and she's not going to say anything back to you because she say you can't define her by what you say about her. I want you to see the Jesus that's in me. And when I'm rolling by in that classic that I am, when I'm dwelling up under the wings of the Most High God, I'm going to be living life large. You know why? Because that one day is today. My promises are today that I have the goodness of God in my life today. I have spent my life giving myself to the world. I've spent my life crying behind the, the, the heartbreak that I've caused and the heartbreaks that have been caused to me. I'm not going to allow myself to stay in a cage of bitterness trapped when I can be set free. If you hurt me, okay, I'm, I'm hurt, I'm going to get over it, I'm going to forgive you, and life's got to go on. And I hope one day we can come together and we can talk about it and we can fix things between us. But if we can't, then it's okay because I want you to know that I forgive you. Why? Because God said in Matthew 6, 14 and 15 that if I can't forgive you, he can't forgive me. I'm not finna let God be mad at me and, and not forgiving me because of you. You're not worth it. You're not worth it. You're my sister. And it's time for us as sisters to rise up and stop coming to conferences and leaving the same. Stop coming on Sunday morning and leaving the same. Stop being somebody that nobody knows who you are whether or not you're saved or not. It is time for us to stand up for Jesus and the real Jesus in our life. Stop spreading somebody else's darkness. Jesus didn't. You should. I want you to close your eyes with me for a minute. Not everybody in here we're going to assume is saved. You never had a visitation with God, with the Lord. But it's time. It's time for you to stop pretending to be a Christian. And it's time for you to become a Christian. Proverbs 13 and 20 tells us to become wise by walking with the wise. If you hang out with fools, you'll watch your life fall apart. It's time, ladies, for us to rise up. And it's time for us to allow the God in us to shine. But if you never met God, if you don't know the tenderness of God and you don't know the love of God, then it's hard for you to let him shine. So your first step needs to be, Lord, I want to be saved. Is there anyone by the raising of your hand that has not made Jesus your Savior? not going to ask you to come down. We just want to pray with you. We want you to leave here with the same advantage we have of Jesus being your Savior, of you coming to know Jesus and him being your Lord. Okay, last chance, anybody. So everybody in here is saved. Everybody in here knows Jesus. Okay. Then our next request is this. If you know that you've been living a life that more resembles the world than it does Christianity, then it's time for you to come before God and ask him for forgiveness and let him change 
the clunker into the classic that you are. It's time, ladies, for us to give up the pretense of wearing the T-shirts that say we are blessed when we are not blessed. It's time for us to stop wearing the jewelry that say we belong to God and we do everything but what God asks you to do. I used to tell God, Lord, I'm a wretch undone. And he said, Mary, you're not a wretch anymore. I saved you. But before he did, I was a wretch undone. I was broken. I was angry. I know what it's like to have a father that doesn't love you. I know what it's like to be married and have a husband that cheats on you for a sport. I know what it's like to allow your life to be changed because of what people do to you and, and you get so tired of being hurt that you feel like I'll just do it back to you, making bad decisions and bad choices. I know what it's like to be so tired and want to sleep at night that I turn a bottle of Old Crow, and Lord, who in the world drink Old Crow? I remember turning Old Crow up one night, drinking some, and I burned my throat up. <laughs> and still didn't go to sleep because my throat was burning, and it was sore. <laughs> but I was doing it the world's way. The world say, just get drunk. Well, I found that bottle, and um, I decided, hey, let me try the world's way. I know what it's like to look at a picture and see someone in their darkness and their shame and see them laughing and knowing that they're really not laughing. They're really crying and they're really hurting. I walked in those shoes. I've laughed at myself. But I also know what it was like the day that I gave myself to Jesus and the days that I continue to give myself to Jesus and the days that I continue to walk to the altar and I continue to say to him, fix this, Lord. Fix this anger that I have in me. I know what it's like when I don't want to walk in obedience, but I need to be submissive. And I have to take that to the altar and ask God, give me the strength, Lord, to be obedient. Give me the strength to follow leadership. Give me the strength to work to make them better. I know what it's like to say, God, help me turn off this television. I'm spending too much time sitting here in front of this television instead of spending time with you. I know what it's like to just blow the dust off my Bible because I'm so angry and so tired of seeing life not ever seem like it's going anywhere in my favor that I just kind of threw my hands in the air and said, just forget this stuff. It ain't worth it no more. Oh, I know what that's like. But the one thing that I do know about it in it all is that I know Jesus. And even when I ran from him, he was right there with me. Even when I wouldn't talk to him, he was still saying, talk to me, Mary. Talk to me. And I was saying, I don't want to talk to you, Jesus. All you want to do is ask me to hurt. All you want to do is ask me to sacrifice. All you want to do is ask me to turn the other cheek. I'm tired of turning the other cheek. When is it going to be my time to reap? I know what that's like. But I know the joy in growing in him and realizing that sometimes his no is not mad. Sometimes his no is because I'm not ready for what I'm asking him for. We ask God for a Cadillac when we can't afford a Volkswagen. And when he doesn't give us that Cadillac, we get mad at God. 
God knows that that Cadillac needs a certain amount of gas and it's going to cost a certain amount. He knows the insurance is going to be a certain amount. He knows you can't afford that Cadillac. So he gives you what you can afford. But you're still a classic. I want to pray for you. Because, see, I know what it's like to be trapped in a life. I know what it's like to feel hopeless. I know what it's like to feel alone. But I guarantee you one thing, that when I let go and I let God, I wouldn't trade it for anything in this world because he truly is that miracle. He truly is the one that I trust and depend on that changed my life. If you would like prayer, would you come down, please? And let us pray for you. Don't take it back home to God. You know yourself that um, if you don't need to do nothing else but come down here and repent for Facebook so you can get yourself renewed and get yourself right, you need to at least do that. But you got some decisions to make because, see, you're not going to be able to go on Facebook again and be able to do what you've been doing because the voice of God is going to follow you. And you're going to hear him say to you, I will judge you. I will judge your love walk. And that's all he's asking us for. He's asking us to walk in love. He's asking us to join the pride. He's asking us to become the lioness that we can join each other and strengthen each other. Women of God, it's time for us to rise up. We've been walling around like chickens on the ground long enough. We are eagles. And it is time for us to rise up and allow the spirit of God that dwells in us to soar. It is time for us to let the yesterdays go. Just like I drag little Benji around on my leg. If I had to drag that weight around all the time, I would sling that little dog off my leg sometimes. And that's the way the weights of yesterday is. If I drug around all my mistakes and all my past on my leg all the time, I would quit. God didn't ask you to drag it. He already paid the price for it. He's asking you to just let it go. Let that anger go. Being molested, that was yesterday. And yes, it was a big thing. But it's not a today thing. Let it go. Being abused, let it go. Mentally, spiritually, physically, let it go. Being hurt by church people, let it go. They are human. They make mistakes. We make mistakes. The world makes mistakes. Let it go. When you keep carrying that baggage around with you, you're trapping yourself. 